Hello, I'm Professor Lou here today with art prof teaching artist Lauren Welch. Hi, Welcome everyone. to our Crit Clash video where we debate famous artists and artworks. Today we are talking about MC Escher. If you guys would like to grow as an artist but you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. All right, here's how Crit Clash works. We are assigning a point of view to each of us. And for today's critique, I'm going to argue against MC Escher. Lauren is going to argue for MC Escher. Now here's the thing though, for that reason, because we assign points of view, what Lauren and I say during this critique video, it may not actually be what we believe in real life, but it might. Maybe you'll be able to figure out, maybe you won't. It's your job to guess if it, if it is how we actually feel or not. Judge our acting skills. Oh my God. <laughs> now I'm in trouble, right? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, I, I, it's a competition for whose acting skills are worse. <laughs> and then at the end of the Crit Clash, you guys get to decide who won. Okay, before we start doing the Crit Clash, I want to give you guys a little bit of information about MC Escher, because while he is very popular, I'm sure some of you maybe have not seen his work before. And hello, Hansa, Ashley, and 10,000 Crows. So glad all of you guys can join us. MC Escher was a Dutch artist. He died in 1972, and he primarily focused in printmaking, lithography, woodcuts, mezzotints. And so actually a lot of his pieces, I think people look at them and they think that they're pencil drawings, but actually a lot of these are prints, which I do think does change actually the way that we're going to talk about the work. Me, of course, being the big nerdy printmaker that I am. First, take your... And MC Escher was an artist who really worked a lot with mathematical objects, concepts of infinity, perspective, tessellations. He was really into Mobius strips and geometry. And what's interesting about him as an artist is that despite the fact that he is a very well-known artist and these images are all over the place. He really was largely neglected by the oh, art world. And I read that. online that actually he did not get his first museum retrospective until he was 70 years old. And this is somebody who had a multi-decade career. And so that was part of his career, but he just never was really appreciated by the so museum cool. and fine arts world. And interesting as well, he did not have any mathematical training. He did hang out with mathematicians, but never did a degree in that. And so basically all of his images, even though they're based on math, they're really based on more his visual and intuitive experience of math. Oh, wow. We got a lot of people in the chat. Yeah. Hello, guys. Daria, Phoebe, Christina, Alice, and Tammy. All right, Lauren, the clash is on. You ready to go? Yeah, I just wanted to give some context, though, about how you said he wasn't appreciated in the art world. And, you know, he's a he's a very accomplished artist. But what was going on at the time is we're talking about the 1900s, like specifically between probably the 1930s and the 1970s. Um, so those periods in the art world were abstract expressionism, cubism, uh, something called lyricism, uh, minimalism. It was all about the form of an artwork and it was all this abstract kind of work that was very popular. So you have someone like Escher who's working very figuratively, very narratively, and he was just kind of considered a softy, like he was considered too representational, just not with the times. You could say he was ahead of his time, maybe. Or behind. That's true, behind too. He, he has more, I feel like he has more um, affinity or relationship with Durer than he does with anyone today, actually. Well, I think you bring up a good point, Lauren, because I do believe that artwork, the way it's received is oftentimes based on the context that it emerged from. Like picture of MC Escher emerged today. 
how totally different it would be. He'd be on Instagram. He'd have millions of followers. It's a completely different world depending on the time period that an artist lives in. Anyway, give me your first argument, Lauren. Well, if he were if he were in the um, if he were in Durer's time or slightly afterwards, hang on, what 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 decade was Durer? Sorry, I don't remember. Oh, Not geez, today. so long ago that we can't count back that far. <laughs> well, yeah. So if I mean, if M. C. Escher was like too far back, they would have he would have probably gotten thrown in jail or something for witchcraft because having that level of perspective and geometry was seen as like the devil's work. Like you don't want to do that. So and yeah, you're right. It's really important about being uh, born in the right place at the right time. But anyway, I feel like his work kind of transcends that. I want to see how he does in like a hundred years from now, because what I think is really cool about Escher is that he has both this technical skill that is really easy to digest. Like you can tell that it is very difficult to make these, and I spent a lot of time on the detail. But then he also has this really like narrative beauty to things. He, he fits into the to the wallpapering kind of pattern movement, textile stuff. But then he's also super mathematical. Like you can study his works in a a geometry class or a math class and get equal pleasure out of that. So he just is very diverse. He fits across a lot of different fields. And I think that's what gives him real staying power. See, I don't think so. Because he's a gimmick artist. Every single one of these pieces is like, look at this cute math trick I can do. Wow, these patterns fit together. Aren't you proud of me? And the thing is, once you figure that out, there's not a lot going on. Like once you realize looking at this image of these ants on a Mobius strip and you realize, oh, it's a Mobius strip, then what do you do? I don't need to look at this beyond that first recognition. Well, when, have you tried to make one of these before, Clara? I think you're doing it a disservice. It's not just like, oh, I'm, I'm making a mathy thing. Like one of the reasons that he's, his work is so big is that there wasn't a lot of work that was like that before then. Like he has these this relationship with like the Mandelbrot series and things like Infinity that are actually really like it's really amazing that he has that capacity to be able to do all this without using actual math because most people that I see that do do this kind of work have to really study it out. Like I had to learn tessellations in my foundations class and that was all just trying to draw like you know measure things out like it was not a super artistic task so I think that can you call it a gimmick if it's like your whole like life's work to develop that skill just because it took a lifetime to do doesn't mean it has a lot of depth I mean you can spend your whole life doing dumb things and it's not necessarily going to pan out as being something really good because these are technically accomplished pieces. As a big nerdy printmaker, I can tell you guys, lithography is really hard to do. I think a lot of people look at these, they go, oh, what nice pencil drawings, but they're not pencil drawings. Lithography is very time intensive. It requires a lot of focus and concentration just to do it correctly, much less well. So I admire that part of it. But the thing is, though, look at this picture, okay? We have these two hands. And you think, oh, the hand is drawing the other hand. Which hand drew it first? It's like chicken and the egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And what are you going to do, sit and ponder that for an hour? People do that. I mean, he uses these motifs that then other people have used over and over and over. For instance, think of the one of the self-portrait looking through the, the glass. So it's like he has a really tiny face, the orb one. Um, I've seen so many artists then riff off of that later. And I think the critique that you have, I mean, you could, you could really take that and put that on like a lot of different artists. I mean, you could say that for Pollock, for instance, like he just he threw paint across a canvas in a very active way. Like, yeah, that style is really cool and I guess you can talk about maybe some uh, like 
you know, this man that is is uh, taking over the canvas like someone takes over land. But like, is there really actually that much else to it? And they all kind of relatively look the same. Like, I think when, when you use that argument that you're using, you're on a slippery slope to just bleaching out the, the value of any art or any artist. See, that's not gonna work, Lauren, because I am not a Jackson Pollock fan. <laughs> All right, in the chat, you guys tell us, do you like MC Escher? Do you appreciate him? Or do you think he's a one hit wonder? Because that's what I feel looking at his work is that we're looking at one offs. And I think that a really amazing artist who can stand the test of time should have a feeling of cohesion, some underlying themes that they are exploring to a very deep level. This feels like a TV show that has no continuity. It's like every single episode is just, oh, something different happens, but it doesn't really that. come together as a mature body of work. I mean, yeah, you could say it's math related, but I mean, that's I pretty broad, that. don't you think? I think that, I mean, one of the reasons why I love him is because he does some, I mean, he references a lot of his patterns and geometries from nature. He was a real like nature enthusiast and had a lot of um, thoughts about conservation and things. So um, it, he does these fish and these swans and these birds, and he really studies these insects and all these different animals that he's working with. I think that there is like a real level of research to his work. He's just interested in that particular thing rather than like say, work about like, I don't know, like uh, mental health or, um, you know, wars and politics. And I think that that work can also be valid. Let's see, in the chat, Erica is saying, I think he's technically accomplished, but there's a lack of emotional content I take issue with. Exactly, all right, I, thank you very much, Erica. I'm gonna jump right on top of that. So here's another thing, if we go back to his technique, his engagement, with his materials. Honestly, I am such a big printmaking nerd. And when I look at his images, I would never really know that these are prints. And that sort of bothers me that when you look at this drawing that he did of the street in Italy, okay? This totally could just be a pencil drawing. He's not really harnessing the unique qualities that you can get from a lithograph or that you can get from a mesotint or a woodcut. This is just basically fancier looking pencil drawings. And I, I just don't think that that's that exciting. Like, why are you going to bother to do all the work there is to do to make a lithograph when in the end it just looks like a pencil drawing? Like, that's such a waste to me as far as the engagement of the material. I think, okay, so two points. The first one relating to um, the emotionalness of the work. I just want to know where, or the emotionlessness of the work. I want to know where that is coming from. Is, is it a result of the technique? And are you looking for more, uh, I'm going to call it, yeah, lyrical mark making, uh, where you can see the hand because um, I would all, or are you looking for an organicness? Because I would also like to mention a couple other artists that kind of fall within his uh, family, art family maybe. Uh, one of them is contemporary artist Anoka Faruqi. Um, she also works with lots of tessellation. She's a painter and moiré stuff that reminds me a lot of Escher's work. Um, but then there's also William Morris, who is best known, he did some painting stuff, but he's best known for his, um, his wallpapers. And there are people that are just obsessed with that, like, like, uh, you know, people in the art world that are obsessed with that work and have like referenced it incessantly, but still it falls within the same kind of like making something that's very technically managed and turning it into this like, like very graphic work. So what is, what qualities make his work different and not accepted over like these other artists that are thought of as pretty um, emotional or delightful or intriguing. I mean, I think there's a big difference between an artwork that's created in the context to be wallpaper versus a standalone print or drawing that we're looking at by Escher. Because with wallpaper, there's a very specific context 
that that work is intended to live within and we engage with it completely differently than how we engage with this image of the ants. And so I don't know that we can put them in the same context because I think wallpaper is all about pattern and all about repetition. But to me, Escher isn't really either. It's sort of like this bland mix, like a little bit of everything. Okay, like let's see, we got a lot of activity in the chat. This, let's see, Alice is saying kind of like Bob Ross, seems kind of cool, but later it becomes easily boring. And Cheyenne is saying a start to patterns and illusions, but I think other artists have made patterns and illusions way more interesting and full of emotion. And Phoebe is saying it's fun to look at this work, how it connects with math visually, but I agree with Erica that's not a deeper meaning to it like some other works. Okay, Ashley's on your side, Lauren. Ashley is saying, I find his work mesmerizing. And James is saying, did he ever claim to be anything special? Did he ever claim to be producing anything more than mathematical art? James, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to go back and do some research. If one of you wants to get online and be one of our personal researchers, you guys are all very good doing lots of detective work. Yeah, you guys are what bring this crit alive, like the past ones of, oh my God, the things we found out through you guys. But so let's talk about the lack of emotional connection, because I think that, yes, his work is pristine and very, very detailed. In fact, there's this whole like conversation that has exploded on our most popular video about the meaning of technical skill and what's its role for an art student yeah. versus a professional. If you guys want to go check it out, just go look at our top video. There's, wow, there's a lot of comments about that. But I yeah. sort of feel like I'm going to use the point of view that I used in that video commentary, which is that, yeah, it's detailed, but it's so clinical. Like there's nothing that I can respond to emotionally. And it, it's sort of like if you watched a film that was like technically really well executed, but you don't care about the characters. Like you could care less if one of them died. That's how I feel about the Usher pieces. I think that you are partial to a particular style is what I think. I, yeah, those are some fighting words, right? They um, are. I, I think that I'm in a class right now that talks a lot about um, the, the content and the separating style from content and having uh, your, I, it's not really totally about this, but I've been thinking a lot about how the style is supposed to serve the content. And so I think what he is primarily interested in is the way these tessellations and mathematics and ways of seeing can be flipped together and changed. And yeah, like the image of the uh, staircases, like he's interested in these impossible modes of perception, which I feel like would not work if he tried to, if he decided to make them more, I'm going to say expressionistic, and I, maybe you guys will understand what I'm, I'm meaning there. Um, I think the, the nature of it, it, its exactness is partly what makes the work so easy to fall into and to be mesmerized by. And uh, like it wouldn't be anything without the mathematics and exactitude behind it. Here's the thing, though. We have somebody who I think is better than MC Escher in every way and who also drew staircases and also was a printmaker. Okay. Guys, Piranesi, come on, all the way. This, this is everything that MC Escher, or at least that Lauren is claiming MC Escher is good at and does it so much better. Okay, so we have the impossible structures. We have the perspective, the use of architecture, but we also have printmaking and that these look like prints. Like these really exert the feel and tactility of a line etching, but these are emotional prints. Those yeah. of you guys in the chat, tell me whether you get an emotional connection to Piranesi's prints okay. or not. Okay. I, uh, this is, so this is the issue that I'm having too, is that you also have a value system where you prefer emotional work over work that does not prioritize emotion. And that, that, is, that is a bias. 
you are a narrative artist. You work in series that are about emotion, literally about emotion. So of course you'd be drawn to something that shows this more moodiness that uh, you like to see in your own studio practice. Um, so I think Piranesi is wonderful. Obviously I love his work. I love his work so much. Um, but I do think that those, these uh, works have very different value or like very different purposes. Like they're not thinking about the same things when they're making these works. Uh, Piranesi is much more related to uh, landscape and architecture. And uh, yeah, having a kind of like mood. Yeah, these were the, the prison pieces were like almost a, a kind of a, like journalism, you know? Um, Whereas MC Escher is like not dealing with any of that. Like he's more of the, I'm going to say he's more of the wallpaper ilk. Like he's just more of like how things fit together and like, uh, like the spatial, uh, like spatial flipping things around mechanics. I think I remember, um, some student in my class <clears throat> whose name started with L a couple years ago, who made a tessellation. Years. For their final project, so aren't you just doing exactly what you're saying that I'm doing? Because you are somebody as an artist who responds I, I, to pattern and mathematical did, things like fractals and. I did do that tessellation, but I kind of abandoned that work for more, I'm gonna say, work that showed the hand more later. If you want to see one of my paintings, I got one right next to me here. I don't want to move the camera though. <laughs> yeah screw things up but um that was one period of my life and I still really do love tessellations but I choose not to work in that way anymore okay in the chat Steven's saying because his art has so much detail and technique there's little emotion being able to manipulate an image to show emphasis on key concepts is important Christina saying it reminds me of Monument Valley I'm an old fart I don't know what Monument Valley is I've heard the phrase but that's it and Cheyenne is saying, even if he added color to the lines and patterns, it could create motion and mood. And Stephen is saying his drawings are very flat. It's difficult to understand what I'm supposed to look at and pull from it. But maybe that's the point. Oh, 10,000 Crows. Yeah. 10,000 Crows, you're on my team. 10,000 Crows agrees on the Piranesi thing. I, I think he is doing something totally different. And like, you've got this one like little bit of crossover there, but they're not even, they, like they both have staircases. Okay, hang on. We're gonna bring up a different example who is okay. related, okay? So if you guys look at some of these MC Escher drawings, some of them really like this one, which is the fish with the leaves on top of it. Let's just pretend it's a pencil drawing, okay? Because th this is very much a style that is reminiscent of pencil, okay? Now, to me, this is technically well done, but it is not Chris Van Allsburg, okay? Chris Van Allsburg is a contemporary illustrator. You guys probably know he did those books, Jumanji. He also did the Polar Express. I mean, he's a quintessential oh, yeah. children's book illustrator. And these are all pencil drawings. And these are stunning pieces where he is truly manipulating the material to make it do something where it transcends the material. Like these are not to me graphite drawings. They're just images. The graphite yeah. is just a vehicle. Whereas I feel like with Escher, he's so clinical and just clean about it. And Again, clean and precise and detailed. That does not make a good artwork necessarily. The, the, but again, the purposes of the artwork are different. Like you just said that, um, I forgot his name, Chris Van, Van Allsburg. Allsburg. He's an illustrator. Like those are works done for like books. There's meant to be a certain cinematic quality to them. Like um, they, they need to tell a story, the story that goes with whatever, you know, person that he's, working with and that again is not you can't really compare that with say um uh escher's like last um creation called snakes which is using hyperbolic uh tessellation going from like these very large things to these tiny tiny little fractal type pieces another artist that i would like to bring up that's within escher's 
uh, group is Colin Prowl, who's a graduate from RISD back in, I don't know, 20, 2012, maybe. Uh, but you can, we can link them later in this. But again, it's like more to do with this mathematical uh, fractalism. And you know, math is a little bit cold. Like that's just how it is. Like this other guy doesn't do anything with math. Again, I think it's just like this prioritization of narrative over uh, geometry or like graphic design or something like that. Yeah, but you're basically saying it's a boring subject, so it's okay for his but, art to be boring. Uh, no, you are saying that because you think that math is boring. It I is. <laughs> I didn't, I, I was telling Clara earlier, guys, so I was going to originally uh, go to school to be an engineer. I was really into math. Uh, but one of the artists that kind of made me make that switch over to art was Escher. And it was because I had so much more fun manipulating shapes and like looking at geometry and tessellations. It was through the tessellations. Um, then I was doing like the straight up math. I was like, oh wow, these things can cross like many different sectors. That's really interesting. Maybe I can combine both in some way. And look, I'm not using math at all anymore. But I think that someone brought up earlier that he's kind of like Bob Ross. And I feel like that is actually a fairly good uh, comparison. And that I think that he takes people, like the art world can be kind of opaque sometimes and kind of like, you know, dramatic and hard to handle. And MC Escher has a certain uh, uh, appeal to the masses that Bob Ross had where it's like, okay, you can make work like this and this is okay. This is a way to get people engaged that wouldn't otherwise be engaged in more like difficult subjects. Like he's an entry point. I think that's wonderful. Well, Ashley is actually going to use your argument against you because Ashley's saying in the chat, I don't feel any emotion. I just remember his drawings from math and geometry classrooms. So he's basically I just this that. cliche because he was on the cover of that book called Girdle. Oh, no, he was in the book, Girdle, Escher, and Bach. I don't know if you guys have ever read that book before. I have not, but it's in our living room. I think my husband read it. But basically, he's just like a math poster i mean there's not a lot going on beyond that right he was poster he's super cool like so i saw the fish turn into birds one that was the first one i saw and then in this was in eighth grade we had to do a project that was like kind of like that and i just like turned it into a nutso thing like I, I made a tessellation that was a turkey, and then I colored every single turkey as a different, like, themed turkey. Oh, my God, it was the most fun I'd ever had on a project, and it was a math project. Well, I saw MC Escher, and it did not help me in high school math class. <laughs> I can tell you that. It did not inspire me in any way. I do want to bring up another example sure. of somebody who uses similar themes. Well, not, not a person, actually. A, a genre of architecture, which is if you look at a lot of the mosques in across the world, a lot of them have amazing oh, tessellations yeah. and patterns that just blow your mind. Okay. Now these buildings, I have never been to this mosque before. It's Iran. But the thing is, I have been in lots of architecture in Europe, like for example, St. Mark's in Venice. And I'm not religious, but those patterns affect you emotionally. Like, how do you explain why a vaulted ceiling in a Gothic cathedral in France, why would that make you emotional? Like, that's about as cold and as mathematical as it gets, because you're building something that has to not fall down. Yeah. But I feel emotional. I think part of that, it's especially interesting with, um, yeah, like Islamic architecture, and I would also add to that, there are some really great examples of that in uh, both Wales and, um, or like uh, England, UK, and in Italy, um, where you have this combination of patterns and architecture that changes and morphs as you traverse the space. Like, I think it's that experiential quality and I know that um, I've also never been in a mosque before, and I wish that I could see these in person, but I do know with, like, the Gothic cathedrals and some of these um, 
you know, these castles that have this really crazy pattern in, um, that experience is like, it's, it overwhelms your senses. You are, you, you feel dwarfed by the experience. Usually the buildings are quite large and the patterns are used to create an optical illusion to make things larger. So I think like, you know, it's hard to hold a candle to these. They really are the most brilliant things in the world. And, um, I think part of that is because they are using many different mediums like together to create something rather than just, you know, just using printmaking or just using drawing. I mean, I do think to a certain degree, it's a little unfair to compare a woodcut to an Islamic mosque. I mean, it can't really compete. But the thing is, I just think the mosques, they're an example of how you can take a yeah. maybe cold mathematical exact pattern and transform it into an emotional experience. Okay, we got a lot in the chat. Luna saying that they are feeling something, but not the kind of dramatic narrative emotion. Wes Williams is saying, shout out to the Lambert sets that were inspired by his work. So it's hard not to imagine yourself in some of his outlandish settings. Oh, that's a really good connection. That's a and great Christina Todd. Ooh, I like Christina. His work is good until you see it compared to the other artists you've shown. And Ashley is saying, I didn't care for Escher until my boyfriend, a scientist, talked about why he loved him so much. They aren't warm, but there is a certain rhythm and movement to them. The Rosalind Chapel in Scotland. Okay, so maybe you have to be a scientist. The rest of us can appreciate it. This is, this is the other thing, though. Okay, so we're looking at very dramatic prison scapes and uh, these wonderful mosques. And if you're like a... Uh, a high school student or someone who's just getting into art making, you're like, oh my God, I could never do that ever. That's like, that's not even of my level. Like I feel almost alienated by it. It's like crazy good. And then you see an Escher and you're like, oh, okay. So this is how this starts. I can figure this out. Like, I think he's like great as like, you know, encouragement to people to actually go in and try something with, you know, try their hand at art making who would otherwise feel like they couldn't do any of that. And that's a reason why you see so much of his artwork copied by, you know, artists of all ages and posted onto Instagram. All right, guys, it is time. Tell us who uh, won this crit I'm clash. I'm Did Lauren okay. convince you uh, for MC Escher? Did I convince you against MC Escher? Because um, I was feeling a little wounded after that Bob Ross crit clash. Oh, yeah. That... I feel like they were, Jordan was making me like argue against the Easter Bunny. Like it was just yeah, so yeah. hard to argue against Bob Ross. Bob Ross is real, like everybody's going to come out to protect Bob Ross. I don't think MCF so I need to recover from that crit clash. I, I need to like get my score back up. <laughs> oh, Christina said you won. That's, a tie. That's, okay. that's that. I, I appreciate that. Ten thousand crows. Yeah, but that, that's not really a vote. That's just to say, ten thousand crows is just saying I love you both. That's not really a vote for you know, either I will, of us. I will take that because apparently you're getting all the other ones. Ooh, I like Ashley. Very cool. All right, we we need a few more though, Lauren. I'm gonna give you. A few more seconds to see if people oh, are I got one. Oh, Wes Williams, MC Escher Thanks. holds a special place in my heart. No. Yeah. Okay, yeah. some of you guys must not have MC oh, Escher oh, in your heart. Maybe he's like deep Tammy. down in the center of the earth or something. Right now we're all tied up. <laughs> wait, Tammy's going to go with Lauren. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Wait, wait, wait. That means it's tied. Oh, and Luna. Wait, what? No. <laughs> Luna. <laughs> um, for all of you guys that do like MC Escher, there is a great book. I can see it from across the room from me. It's called Codex Seraphinius or Seraphonis. Um, it is a beautiful book of not of uh, more surrealist, but MC Escher like drawings by this crazy Italian guy. You, you should... know what we'll do? Guys, we'll put all that stuff in the video description below all the artists that we mentioned. So that way you can go and look them up later. Cause I'm curious about this book as well. Yeah. 
Let's see. Um, okay, Hi. Ashley is saying, well done, even though Ashley is on I Team know, Clara. I know. I know. Totally. It's yours. You tied people <laughs> need to choose. There, there are 24 people watching right now, but I see, like, what, like, maybe 10 people commenting, 10 or, 10 or 12 people commenting. So all you other people on here, you need to break the silence. You need to break the tie. Yeah, I, I think this is pretty much a tie until somebody jumps in and... You guys, it's you a statement. In the comments afterwards, like yeah, and and by the way, if you guys miss the live stream, you can tell us in the comments who you think, and then Lauren will have a real, a time. real battle. <laughs> One that's actually fair. Because cool. <laughs> we can't do this, guys. I need to like get my ego back. I was so bruised by Jordan, and I'm so sad about that. <laughs> Anyway, guys, what? Oh, no, 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 Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Clara, you're going I don't bad. like you guys anymore. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, guys, I hope that you'll explore some of our other Crit Clash videos and also some of our free resources on our main site, artprof.org. And that if you like our channel, you subscribe and ring the bell to get notifications. And again, thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys keep us up and running. And thank you so much to all of you guys who came into the chat, except for those of you who voted against me. I don't like you anymore. We have, We're we not have friends. several more people, Jamie, Dolores, and Julia um, all commented. Oh, wait. <laughs> Yeah, we got anyway, guys, thank you so much. We will see you next time. Bye.